This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Cars and buses and things that go tonight on Behind the Headlines. Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're joined tonight by three guests to talk about the transportation needs and the present, the future uh, in the whole Memphis area. Uh, introduce John Cameron, city engineer for the city of Memphis. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, thank you for being here. Also, Pragati Srivastava, the administrator, Memphis Metropolitan Planning Organization. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. And Tom Fox, interim general manager for MATA. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. So let me start with a really big question, and I'll go left to right. You know, Memphis and the transportation needs, everything from buses to bike lanes to sidewalks to striping, and you all have a different part, some overlapping parts in this, this whole mix. But if you could draw the city or the region, let's say, from scratch, um, how would you do things differently? And I'll start with you, Pragati. That it's a massive area. Your organization covers from parts of DeSoto County, Fayette, Tipton, Rhodes. I mean, again, everything from the biggest projects people see to the smallest. How would you do things differently? Well, uh, as part of the MPO, or we are a federally mandated organization, so our presence is a lot dictated by what the regulations kind of require us to do. Um, our planning area is actually Shelby County, Fayette County, mm -hmm. DeSoto County, and Marshall County, so we don't go into Tipton Excuse County. Yeah. yeah. And um, in Arkansas, you know, they have their own West Memphis MPO, so, but we do coordinate well with them. Yeah, transportation is, in this area is pretty big and it can be very challenging, but um, I think, as we all know, with transportation, the best approach to look at things is how do we combine the local needs up to the regional level, because nobody just goes around their city, you know, they travel throughout the region. So I think the regional way to look at the transportation, I think, makes sense. And it, we'll go to you, Tom. You, I was looking at your map before we did the show today, the, the route map. And you know, I, I will admit that I've never ridden a bus here. I did in other cities in New York, when I live, buses and subways and all that. I haven't ridden a matter bus, but I see them and drive next to them all the time. The route map is huge. You cover this massive area. So again, to that big picture question, how would you do things differently if you could draw the city or the transportation infrastructure from scratch? What would you do differently? Well, I think we'd like to, like to be cover more area than we do now. We're essentially city of Memphis and maybe outside the city a little bit, but there are definitely regional needs. And it's our vision that we would expand to be a true regional transit agency and strengthen our, our core services in the areas where people that don't have cars need, need a high level of service and then it kind of expand out to different types of service for the areas that, that people with cars to try to encourage them to use public transportation instead of driving. And I, I got to imagine one of the big, biggest things that stands in the way of that is money. And we'll talk about right. funding on all these fronts, but that, I mean, right. it's an expensive proposition. Uh, just looking at that map and the number of people you already serve, which is in the millions every year. Right, right. We typically, transit agencies cover 20% or so of their costs from passenger fares. The rest has to come from, from, from public agencies. And we get our money from City of Memphis, State of Tennessee, and federal government. So, but for us to become regional, we would need other partners to kind of contribute to the, to the yeah. funding. We'll come back to the kind of funding questions and how that all works, but I'll get to you to that big kind of almost silly question I've asked, so, but how would you do things differently? And again, you're dealing with everything down to the sidewalks and the curb specifications right. and the big picture things of traffic lights and, and roads and, and so on. Sure, sure. I, I think one of our biggest challenges is the sheer size of, of our region. Uh, Memphis, the city of Memphis itself is 345 square miles and we're relatively low density population wise. So providing transportation over such a large footprint is, is really a challenge. Yeah, and when you talk about that, the density, and maybe come back to you, uh, Pragati, the, that's gotta be a challenge. I mean, it's a massive city from a square mile point of view in a region, but not that dense. And so that's where people would maybe, you get people who'd say, oh, I wish we weren't building all these highways and so on, but there's a lot of distance between Collierville and downtown Memphis, and there's got to be some way to connect those. But how do you guys approach that? I mean, the, the, the sheer size of it and the, the relatively low density of the area. 
Yeah, that has been a kind of like a continued challenge for us in this area. And, you know, I think the efforts that have been happening in the last few years with the, you know, development in the core areas, and uh, I think that has been really encouraging, you know, especially for us at the regional level. And uh, I think uh, the biggest challenge that I see with uh, being such a massive system is the maintenance of the system, because, you know, you do have some capacity issues that we have to address, but, you know, it also kind of boils down to how do we maintain the system that we have. And let's talk about funding for a second, kind of general terms, but funding for highway, I mean, on-ramps, the big project, say, at, at 240 and Sam Cooper right now, that funding comes from who? Uh, that funding, it, it's a state highway project, okay. so it is managed by the Tennessee Department of Transportation, and um, it has basically 80% or 90% of the funding is coming from the federal government, and the match is provided by the state of Tennessee. And not local money when, when a project like that is happening? Uh, generally, it is... Uh, matched by the state. Okay. And then, oh, by local, I meant city or county. And same, another big project, you know, the outer ring, I, I always think of it as 385, but maybe it's 269. 269, okay. yeah. So I'm, I'm behind on the names. numbers. But yeah, <laughs> that whole project, again, that's at least part under your auspices, and that funding comes from? Again, federal government federal, and state yeah. government, yes. But then once you get, maybe I'll turn to you, once you get down to the city level and the curbs and you're putting in new streetlights, where do, that money is almost entirely local money, or how, how does that well, work? Well, it's a mix. And what a lot of people don't understand is a lot of the local streets, the subdivisions, are paid for by private developers. So, so the smaller streets are, are privately funded. Uh, you get into some of the, the what are called collectors and arterial roadways, and those start to become a city responsibility. And in some cases, they do qualify for federal and state funds okay. to help with those. Back to the density issue and, and transportation. I mean, that's tough. You talked about 20% in general that you know um, that public transportation systems are 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 paid for by fares. If you you have to serve this huge area, I think you guys listed at 300 and. 10, 311 square miles that you're covering. There's only so many riders every mile to pay for those buses and pay. So how do you how do you balance that? Well, density is, is absolutely a key to the way we structure our services. The higher density areas get more service, obviously, and the lower density areas get less service and, and even different types of service. Ideally, you'd like to have uh, maybe more circulator feeder routes in the outlying areas, park and ride in the outlying areas, whereas in the inner, inner higher density areas, you have buses running every 15 or 20 minutes. So, so you adapt your service levels to the densities and it's, of course it's not only residential density but it's also employment density too because there are a lot, of, a lot of jobs that are in locations that are difficult to serve or expensive to yeah. serve but they still need some kind of service. There, there's a, I don't know if you saw it, there's a great study um, and people can look it up in the New York Times if they're, if they're into this sort of thing but it was on economic mobility in the United States and they, they found that it was Atlanta that was the least economically mobile uh, city and the, in, the theory being that the way Atlanta set up, a lot of the people at the poorer end are so far removed from the jobs. Coming back to what yeah. you said, and that they yeah. did, they don't have. And we think of, you know, if you're in Memphis, you think of Atlanta as being a very big and successful and incredibly prosperous city. But the mobility there, according to this study, was so low in large part because there was poor public transit from the poor areas of town <laughs> to the wealthier areas where the jobs are. I guess we have some of that same dynamic, and it's kind of an American dynamic. Yeah, um, I think it's a very common dynamic across the country. And do you work with employers? I mean, switching to kind of the employment, I mean, do they come to you saying, hey, can you please get, you know, help me get workers to my area? I mean, how responsive are you able to be to that? Yeah, we're, well, we, we constantly try to reach out to employers whenever we can, and we are also talking lately about, about transportation management associations, which would be groups of employers banding together to, to provide some kind of services to supplement what MATA can provide. But we're always willing to work with employers. We, we try to promote uh, passes. Employers can buy passes for the employees, and that would help defray the cost. But there, it, it usually comes back down to if we're going to expand service, how is that service going to be paid for? And, and is, it, is right. it new money coming in, or is it some service that's going to have to be moved from some other location? Yeah. And are you involved with the <coughs> hop on the people, in the, at least in the downtown? It's a, it, is that? kind of what you're talking about with these transportation I mean that's or is that totally separate from MATA? Well there's a there's definitely that's a private okay. private sector initiative which certainly fits in to help fill the gaps and some of the things that MATA is not yeah. really set up to do. 
So that's a good example of these transportation management associations would be another example of, of private uh, sectors coming in to, to supplement. Right, right. And it, I mean, switch to you in terms of, I talked about businesses and you know, some of what we think about with the roads are, are people going to the store, people going to school, but to what extent do you have to be responsive to the business community in thinking about how roads and infrastructure and transportation and so on are, are set up? Absolutely. Uh, Memphis is a transportation hub. We have a lot of logistics located in Memphis. You, you go to uh, FedEx, uh, a lot of large trucking companies are located here. We have, uh, I believe, five major railroads that, that all come right. into Memphis. So uh, transportation and, and for employment, transportation for freight uh, are all considerations that, that we have to think about when we're developing our plans for improvements to the roadway and, and uh, transportation network. What, and I don't know where your, um, your, your area of authority ends just geographically when you get down into the airport district and the warehouse district and all that, but there's been talk, and this may be as much a question for you, about trying to improve that area. It's kind of great when you drive through there, if you're just doing it even because you're driving to Birmingham or you're driving to Atlanta and it's in one of the busiest, most you know, commercially active trucking areas and you've got a stoplight every three, is that in the city of Memphis? And is, so that's on you all to, to that, try that and That is in the city of Memphis. Yeah. Uh, we, and we I, let, me, let me interrupt you just sure. there. I'm talking about that area of kind of Lamar, 78, once you get down and, and you're getting close to the Mississippi border and it is just kind of crazy when you're driving around there that there isn't a better connector um, for the trucks, let alone the tourists or the people just trying to do business traveling. Absolutely. And uh, you've probably heard of the Aerotropolis Initiative. Uh, that area is a focus area for transportation yeah. issues, and, and we've had some pretty good success. Uh, we actually have the state of Tennessee working with the federal government are going to be starting some projects on Lamar Avenue to improve transportation in that area. Yeah, your thoughts on that area. I mean, it must be maddening to you as a planner, you know, that it's, back to my opening question, one thing you'd do differently, I would imagine that corridor, you'd love to wipe that clean, and, and not, not the people, I mean, but the way the transportation works in that area. Right, and, and that's like a big, you know, transportation hub, you know, freight hub and part of the MPO area as well as the city. And uh, yeah, I would, you know, we have been working with the state to get that thing fixed. And if, unfortunately, the cost is really high, but, you know, it's going to be done in piecemeal, but we are moving forward yeah. with that. And is that the kind of thing where you, you really, you need the, the, the wallet of the federal government to make something like that really happen? Or can the, does the state have the money to do it over time? It's it probably, you know, just because the connection that it has with the airport, as well as the connection to Birmingham, Alabama, as well as Mississippi, I think this is definitely where we, you know, the more federal funds we can get, I think that would be beneficial. Yeah, yeah. And uh, unfortunately, right now, you know, the current transportation bill is expiring in September, so we are right now kind of waiting to see if it's going to be extension or not, but, you know, they kind of works in a way, but... How, how much, not to put you in an uncomfortable position, but how much does, you're very dependent on that federal money, even if it's flowing through the state, and the way Congress works right now it, it is so, well, some would call it dysfunctional, and you don't, I mean, you're trying to plan for the long term. I mean, looking right. at your website, you've got plans out to 2014, but you don't know exactly how your funding is going to work in the short term. That has to be maddening. It is, and we, you know, the best thing that we can do at this point is kind of work with our state partners, both on Tennessee and Mississippi side, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, make sure that the projects we have in the pipeline are moving forward and they're not, you know, affected right. by this right. uh, this issue <laughs> that right. we are dealing right now with. Right. Um, and your, we talked a little bit before, so just your, your area of, you know, kind of uh, authority doesn't extend to the railroads, but you work closely with them. It does not extend to the airport, but obviously you're trying to help uh, connections to and from the airports both right yeah. yeah yeah absolutely because most of the freight traffic that we have in our area it's almost like close to like 50 percent is truck traffic so even though the trucks are coming in and out of the intermodal yard to at the port authority area as well as the airport area there's a lot of truck traffic happening so that is directly affecting you know the operations of the highways as well as neighborhoods and things of that nature so yes we do work very closely with them we have a freight advisory committee um, uh, which kind of you know deals with these kind of issues and works with our freight partners and your group is again because it's it's um mandated by the federal government and covers right. this broad area. So you've got lots of different mayors, different counties, Mississippi, different states. Does everyone work nice and get along or is it kind of, ten I mean, is everyone on the same page? Because 
the companies maybe don't care if they might be located in DeSoto right. County, but they're using the Memphis airport in a train rail place in Fayette County. The companies right. maybe sometimes don't care, but the politicians do. So how do you manage that? Well, that's always <laughs> challenging. <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, region or regionalism is, you know, is the way, like you said, you know, the companies right. kind of see things. So they don't necessarily like to follow like the state boundary or the county or the city boundary. And uh, we work well with our board members, which includes all the mayors and supervisors and all these members right. from uh, the MPO area and kind of, you know, work through the process and, you know, as well as the state DOTs yeah. to get some of these right. initiatives implemented and try to build a consensus on different issues. Yeah, um, Let's go from the, the big trucks and, and all that down to the bike lanes. I mean, it's one of the most visible changes from a transportation point of view, I think, in the last years in Memphis. And, you know, famously, Memphis was constantly named the, the least bike-friendly city. I don't know where we rank now, but it's got to be quite a bit higher. That's also, in part, under yes. your auspices. So talk about that initiative and, and the successes and what and, and failures or, or learn you know things you've learned in terms of putting those bike lanes and bike paths and so on in. It um, I would say it kind of started 2009 you know when we had the Shelby Farms Green Line open and that was I think the success of that particular project it was funded through the MPO you know to the federal mm -hmm. funds that came through our organization and I think that was a big catalyst in getting things going throughout. And I think what we are seeing right now, you know, it, our process is very technical, it's very data oriented, so we have to kind of check with the citizens and find out how things are going and what the changes in demographics are and things of that nature. What we are seeing is people are really looking for options, you know, so how we can best provide those options to them, I think. and putting these bike lanes, you know, I think has been working out well, you know, it, there's still a long ways to go, right. but, you know, from Memphis all the way to Coyle World, all the way to Fayette County, right. there are bikers everywhere, and, you know, now because of these facilities that we have, you know, we see them on the roads using it quite often. Right, so. and, it, and there are more bike lanes going in, the, the project is not done. No, it's... It, we have a long way to go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. And that also gets to you. I mean, look, just even looking at your website, you have design guidelines and all these kind of that. That's a new phenomenon within the city engineer's office, I assume. Right. In the past three or four years, we we really put an emphasis on it with the leadership of the mayor. Um, but from the transportation perspective, uh, we, we're looking at multimodal transportation. Uh, things like bike transportation helps extend the range of the bus routes. The bus routes may not be able to cover. Uh, get close to everybody, but with a bicycle, if you live within a mile of a uh, bus route, you can get there relatively easy and, and take your bike with you. So we're, we're putting an emphasis on multimodal transportation to help close this economic gap for folks who may not have a, a automobile in their household and may only have one automobile in their household to provide them options. Yeah, and that's, I guess that is different. I mean, some of what you know, you think about with the bikes, the Green Line, which is recreational or sport or however you want to term that, parks, the connection that's going into Overton Park. But I hadn't, I have to honestly admit, I hadn't really thought about it as, you know, an alternative. I mean, people, although actually I see people, I'm driving my car, but I see people riding their bikes to work downtown and so on. And so I guess that's part of what you're talking about with these right. strategies. So, so we're providing more options, providing opportunities for people to, to have other ways of getting around. Yeah, yeah. And you all, I, I see the bikes on the front of the buses yeah. and that's been successful? Uh, yeah, it's been great. We're in up into the thousands of bikes per month that use yeah. our buses. All of our buses have bike racks. All of our transit centers have bike racks, so yeah. we, we see this as a really nice complement right. to what, what we do. And those went in, and I think you got some, probably in hindsight, unfair criticism, probably from the media, that the, 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 uh, you guys became bike friendly before a lot of the bike paths were mm -hmm. in. And so I guess sometimes maybe that's the struggle with all these transportation issues is it's a chicken and egg thing. Where do you start? So you all maybe had funding or whatever, an idea to, to, mm -hmm. to make the buses bike friendly and carry them, but there were no lanes for them. But you did it anyway. Right. And people were using the bike racks back. We've had them for seven or eight years yeah, so on the thinking, buses. Yeah. And, but now with the increased exposure and emphasis on bike lanes, right. that's, that's when the number of the right. usage has just gone through the roof. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the, the connector, because it's a little bit different, if I understand correctly. And we're getting into the, the weeds of, of engineering here, but why not? The connector between um, Overton Park and um, what's called what the Hamp Line, the Broad Avenue. It's a right. different kind of bike lane than, than the, has ever been put in in Memphis. Am I right about that? that that's correct. Uh, we've been part of what's been called the Green Lanes Initiative 
over the last couple of years. And, and as we've started putting in bike lanes, we've been learning and we've been looking at what the next step is in bike lanes. And what we're trying to do is, is make uh, bicycle lanes more accessible, more comfortable for more people to use. Uh, so one of the, one of the uh, strategies you can use is to put in what's called a buffered bike lane where you separate the bike lane somehow either physically or, or, or maybe as simple as putting in some striping for a three to four right. foot buffer between the bicycles and the moving traffic. So the, what's called the HAMP line, which is going to connect the green line to uh, Overton Park, is going to be being designed in that manner where the bicyclists will be more separated from the moving traffic, make it more comfortable for bicyclists, particularly those bicyclists who may be using the green line, uh, to continue on to yeah. Overton Park. Yeah, and who, talk about the, from Overton Park, the, there's also work to get across the Harahan Bridge to, um, to Arkansas. We've talked about that before, but did that come through your group or <clears throat> was everybody a little bit a part of that in terms of implementing the, and this is the connector from West Memphis all the way to the Ghost River ultimately, right? I mean, right, way right. out in Fayette County. So from West Memphis all the way up to North Parkway, and even beyond in downtown, uh, the, the main domain project will be building bicycle and pedestrian connections. Uh, that funding came through a federal TIGER grant, so there's a lot of federal funds in that, about 15 million in federal funds, but then just a, a whole consortium of, of uh, local and private funds going into it, and we've had real good success working with private parties on, on some of these initiatives. And then that also does uh, improvements to the streets downtown, is that right? And even to the tracks for the trolleys, it, right. it begins to bleed into that. Yes, there's a component of, uh, of upgrades to the trolley tracks on South Main. Because that does get to, I mean, people talk about, uh, you know, potholes and the condition of the roads downtown right now is, is really pretty bad. I mean, I, I should be more objective, but I drive downtown every day. Mm -hmm. That will, will some of this money be put towards cleaning up the, the roads down there? And maybe I'll put you on the spot in terms of that. Pro We've had Kim Conrad from the city council on before that, right. I mean, he, he says, and he's a, a real critic of city spending, but he says, we just don't spend enough on roads. I mean, he, I, I'm paraphrasing him. He'll probably call me and tell me I got it wrong. But paraphrasing him, we've got to do better, and, and it takes money and, it, and so on, too. So what about the state of the roads downtown and throughout the city, potholes and so on? Certainly, it, it takes investment. And this goes back to how spread out we are and how, much, how many lane miles of road we need to cover our area and the density right. that we have. So it, it, it's hard to sustain the number of miles of roads that we have. And, and keep them paved and adequately repaired. We have, uh, over the last several years with the recession, had some budget cuts which yeah. have impacted that. Uh, we've been able to leverage some federal money, uh, some uh, surface transportation right. program funds to help us do some paving projects. And in fact, a lot of the uh, stimulus program funds went towards repaving. Yeah, yeah. Also, um, you are, um Implementing the, the new parking meters, the yes. the, the new paid ones. They're um, um, put the ticket. I mean, it's been implemented over the last what three four months. Seems like right, right since the first of the year. How is that going? I mean, part of it, the promise was in part to raise some money for the city. I, I assume, or at least because people just weren't using the coin op ones as as, as much as they should have. Right. But how is it going? So the, the whole parking program is put in place to manage the parking downtown. We, we have basically meters in areas where we want the parking spaces to turn over, uh, where, we, where folks coming in to have lunch or, or do business down in the Civic Center uh, can have a, a short-term parking on street. So the strategy is to put in meters that allow for up to two hours of parking yeah. and let that space turn over over two hours. So with the new meters, we've put in the capability of accepting credit cards and debit right. cards, which has really proved to be a convenience and made it easier right. for folks to be able to pay for right. parking. Do you have financial results yet on that? I mean, is it meeting goals? Is it too early to tell in terms of the revenue that comes in from that? It, it's pretty early, but it's, it's yeah. meeting goals. And, and the right. initial goal is to make sure that we are paying for the new equipment out of the increased revenues right. so that there's no burden to the taxpayer, but and, it's the and, users. And your office puts those up and maintains them, but it's the police who um, 
make sure they are enforced. Is that right? It, it's enforced by the police, but we also right. do have parking enforcement technicians okay. housed within the right. engineering division. They're very vigilant. I can just say that as someone who works downtown and has worked downtown for a long time, and it's been a change, and I'm just doing my part to, uh, <laughs> to fund the city and the meters as we go, which also leads us to your, your office puts up the traffic cameras, the intersect intersection traffic cameras, is that correct? And there are more of those going in. These are the, the video cameras, the automatic ones right, that right. catch people going through a red light or a yellow light. And so we on. don't actually put those up, but okay, we, we coordinate me. with the police okay. and their vendor. They okay. have a vendor who puts them up and maintains them. So, okay. so we work with them on identifying those locations where they're high accident locations. Okay. Those are also very effective. Right. I'll just go ahead right. and say that I found those to be very good. Um, and for you, uh, just a minute or so left, you tweaked in the last six months a year. There's been a bunch of tweaking to the routes for Mata. Is there more? There was some experimenting with express buses. What's next and kind of new and different routes and express buses or, or other? Well, we're, we're, we're implementing a plan that we had prepared about two years ago. We've been kind of doing it in phases. And, and by the end of this year, we should have all the, all the, the, the major elements of the plan implemented. Now, some of the outlying areas will still be working on parking rides and those kinds of things. Uh, one of the projects that we've done, we've worked with, with John's group on is, is a signal priority. We have all of our buses equipped to be able to recognize equipment at traffic signals to, to keep the lights green longer to speed up the buses. Yeah. We, have, uh, we have it on Poplar Avenue and we have it on portions of Elvis Presley Boulevard. It's been, it's been great. We've, got, we've, we've actually demonstrated 20% travel time savings yeah. on those two quarters and we'd love to be able to expand that. And just a quick last question, the, the, the money, the federal money to retime all the lights to keep the traffic flowing better, we didn't get that grant, are we trying again, does that go through you? Uh, actually, we, we do have a project in place, we have a hundred some miles okay. of corridors that we're coordinating, okay. uh, most recently Walnut Grove Road. All right, awesome, thank you, thank you all three for being here, thank you for joining us, join us again next week, good night.